everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, A Practical Guide to High Availability Solutions for Postgres, brought to you by EDB. I would like to introduce you to our presenters. Vibor Kumar, VP of Performance Engineering at EDB, and Mark Winster, CTO of EDB. Vibor has many years of leadership experience in designing innovative business solutions for customers. He has in-depth experience with cloud technology, management, training, and database technologies, like Oracle, MySQL, PostgreSQL, DB2, and EDB Postgres Advanced Server. He has mastery in evaluating requirements for business technology integration and service activations. Before joining EDB, Vibor served in senior positions at Uptix, IBM, BMC Software, and CMC Limited. Mark Linster, PhD, is EDB's Chief Technology Officer. Mark provides architectural know-how to help customers accelerate the use of Postgres in their digital transformation projects. Mark has an extensive background in engineering, technology, and logistics, with 20 years in management experience. Before joining EDB, Mark served in senior positions at Polycom, TriPoint Interactive, and Avicon Group. And with that, I will pass it off to our presenters. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, uh... Let's uh, let's look at the agenda for today. Um, so we'll talk briefly about Postgres and EDB, and you know, just uh, we'll be very brief about EDB, but we still want to give you some background. Um, and then we'll go dig into high availability and always on, and we'll explain why we think those are actually two different things. Um, then we'll start digging into the real heart of the, uh, the presentation, which is uh, the differences between streaming replication, logical replication. Uh, what we did with BDR to address some of those problems, and um, you know how we take that to the next level with a couple of sample architectures, and then we'll review decision criteria that you can use to figure out you know where should you go, which which option for high availability should you choose with Postgres. We'll point you to some resources, and uh, we'll have time for questions. So our plan is to. Um, have a, a webinar of about 45 minutes and leave at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the day for, um, uh, for, for questions. If there are any questions that we can't answer during the webinar, we'll try to get back to you in writing and uh, with a complete list of the answers. So let me start first with an important statement, which is what we believe. Um, and we're convinced that Postgres is the most transformative open source tech since Linux. And that's really, really important for us, not just because we're Postgres nuts and convinced of it, but I think it's really something that everybody should understand to evaluate the true potential of Postgres and why it is so important to understand how to really use Postgres for business purposes. And obviously, high availability is, is absolutely key to making a database a, a real business tool. So why do we believe this? And let me share some data with you because you know when you listen to the press when you listen to the media you may hear other players being like um, the winners in the database game we'll just share some data with you and then you can make up your own mind so first postgres was named three times postgres uh, database of the year by db engines ranking okay they they look at web traffic queries etc and that's how they come to their conclusions it's kind of interesting but then much more let's say objectively data driven are things like uh stack overflows developer survey they quizzed 20,000 developers for their preferences and when you look at most popular most loved most used um Postgres is the number one database by developers by far and far ahead of others who are much more popular in the media. When you look at Datadog and their survey on uh, what is being used in containers, you can again see that Postgres is the number one real database in that space, right? I mean, Redis is really more of an in-memory cache, so I nearly don't count it as a, as, a, as a database. But again, it's extremely popular in this new technology. Then look at the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's tech radar that they published uh, um, in the fall of last year. And in there, Postgres again is the first, is the number one real database. Um, because I'm saying that Redis and Elasticsearch really are not really databases, um, but one could argue about that. But the important thing is that Postgres, when compared to so many other databases, has clearly won this race. So 
that's the data why we're convinced that Postgres is the most transformative open source technology since Linux. Now, having said that, how do we how do we bring Postgres to bear in the enterprise? Well, we at EDB, we are really the Postgres experts. We're contributing as you know more to Postgres than than anybody else, and we've been with Postgres for now over 15 years. Some of our team members in the CTO office have been with the Postgres community since the very beginning, since for 25 years have been driving Postgres forward. So we have tremendous depth in Postgres and we're bringing a lot of expertise to the table. And you know we've contributed a whole lot to Postgres over the years. Um, and I think that's what makes us qualified to make some of the statements that Vibor and I are going to make in, uh, in, in this presentation here. So some of the names that you know work at EDB or work with EDB that that make us confident to say that we really truly understand Postgres are folks like Mike Stonebreaker. For those of you who don't know who Mike Stonebreaker is, well, he was the one who invented Postgres over 25 years ago, 30 years ago at Berkeley, and then um, and he today is an advisor to uh, to EDB, and then people like Bruce Momgen who has been with the Postgres community for 25 years since Postgres came out of Berkeley and went into open source. He has been part of the team that drove that forward. And on others like Peter Eisentrout, Robert Haas, Simon Riggs, if you go to any Postgres event, any Postgres conference, you read any of the proceedings of the conferences, or you look at the, at the most famous Postgres books, you'll see those names appear again and again. Okay, and that's the expertise that we bring to the table. And that's again, why we feel confident to, um, to make the statements that we're gonna make now in this, uh, um, in, this, in this presentation here. And, you know, we use Postgres with our customers for many things. Migrations from legacy databases, that's its own topic. It's a big deal, mostly coming off of Oracle or DB2 or SQL Server going on to Postgres. That's a really big attractor to Postgres. Now, Postgres is also used a lot for developing new apps. When we look before at the statistics from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or at Stack Overflow or at Datadog's um, statistics about what was deployed in containers, that's all or mostly building new apps, right? Or moving to the cloud. And we're active in all of, in all of those spaces. And then the, the product portfolio that we bring to the table brings you the databases, so both open source Postgres and a Oracle compatible version of Postgres, the right tools to make Postgres highly available, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, tools to deploy Postgres on-prem, in the cloud, in containers, through a DBAS, and then the expertise that I mentioned before. So those are the things that we bring to the table. So now you understand why we are excited about Postgres, why we th what we think the potential of Postgres is, and you also know a little bit about, uh, about our company. Now let me dive into high availability and always on. And first, I'll talk about why are high availability and always on actually two different things. See, high availability is something that we've known historically. And we've historically talked about that concept, and it really means that highly high availability covers a system in case of hardware failure or failure in the underlying software or in the network, for example, right? So it was a protective mode that made sure that software could survive a hardware crash or um, a network crash or failover, et cetera. Well, historically that was true. That's what we talked about. High availability, 99.9 .9 or 95 or whatever meant, um, you know, outside of maintenance windows, because when this term was created, everybody still had maintenance windows. But now today, in situations of digital transformation, we don't have maintenance windows anymore. Our software runs all the time. I was a CIO quite a few years ago, and we had maintenance windows. From Friday evening, eight o'clock, till Monday morning, eight o'clock, we could pretty much do whatever we wanted. So we had time for batches and, and all these kinds of things. In digital transformation, that's all disappeared. It's always on. So there's a fundamental difference between 
high, highly available and always on. Always on really means it's always on. And that also means you have to be able to cover software maintenance windows and not go down. You have to be able to update, upgrade, fix things and keep on running all at the same time. And that's really where the difference is between uh, always on and, uh, and highly available. Now, why is it so hard, right? I mean, when we talk about these nines, what does it really mean? Well, this table here is pretty obvious. Everybody can do the math, but this table here is pretty impressive when you really look at it, what it means, okay? So, you know, if I have four nines of availability, that means that I have almost five minutes per month where I can be down and I still meet my SLA, you know? I have a lot of time during the year. I have almost an hour during the year where I can be down and still meet my SLA. Down, unplanned downtime, right? If I'm going to five nines, well, now, you know, I got less than 30 seconds per month where I can fail. And I have a little over five minutes per year where I can be down. So you can see this is extremely aggressive. Any little blip, any upgrade, any update, any change in the schema, anything will, you know, screw up your, your five nines availability if you don't have software that can play right through that. That is truly always on. Now, how important is that? Well, this is a survey from, um, from IT, ITIC uh, done last year, and I can share that with you. Um, and that really, that, that reflects how businesses value unplanned downtime, okay? Where the majority of the respondents said that unplanned downtime of an hour or more cost them over $300,000. And you can really see that that is pretty easy, right? You don't, you don't need a whole lot of orders that you're missing in an hour to actually, to actually see this kind of failure happen. So downtime costs a lot of money today. And downtime in many environments is completely unacceptable. We at EDB, we work with payment providers or we operate payment gateways for credit card companies. And um, there's no downtime, right? These things have to run all the time. A few seconds of downtime and the phones ring, right? I mean, we, our software is being used by, for, uh, by security companies that, uh, that automate electronic badges and, and uh, authentication for computer systems. There's no downtime because when authentication doesn't work, nobody can log in, nobody can do anything. So downtime is completely unacceptable. So you can see very quickly that going from high, highly available to always on really is a change of philosophy and it requires a completely different type of software. Now there's three ways this can be done in Postgres. And I'll turn it over now to, uh, to Vibor to talk about how this works. In summary, it means the ways to do this is you can have uh, a shared disk type of setup. And probably the most famous um, uh, setup to do that is Red Hat Cluster Server. And that used to be a very, very popular uh, option. I would say about eight or 10 years ago, that was probably the way to do, to create a highly available Postgres system. But it's very expensive, requires specialized hardware, and it's really, it's not something that we see a whole lot of anymore. Then there are two other options that are more native to Postgres, streaming replication and logical replication. And today, we'll spend the rest of this conversation to talk about the differences between streaming replication and logical replication, what the pros and cons are, or and when you would use which one of these options. So now I'm going to turn it over to the board to talk about the, um, the actually the heart of the matter here. Vibori, unmute. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I forgot to unmute myself, but yeah, thank you for reminding me. And now I'm unmuted. All right. Um, so before we get into the details of uh, the capabilities for which Postgres has. Let's go through the evolution, right? Because Postgres, what we have right now, has gone through many evolution and added many capabilities over the year. So when Postgres was there, at that time it did not have the native capability around replication or high availability. And for that, there were some open source projects available, like Laundry Site, Bucardo, and Sloney. 
these were the very popular uh, rep um, replication solutions. And I still remember with version 8.4 and with the version 8.3 for creating the high availability, we used to use Sloney because Sloney has its uh, uh, trigger based application and has the ability to do a switch over, fade over. You could do all those the things very easily with the native command support by this Lonnie. Then there were other commands, other tools like Lonnie Side and Bucardo too. Then, then later on, community realized that, of course, they need uh, something inbuilt inside the Postgres. And that's why from ver version uh, 9.0 onwards, community added the new capability called streaming replication. Streaming replication is more like a physical replication if you are aware of the uh, concept of the physical replication where you're replicating the same database as it is from one server to another server. It's a block level replication where uh, the stru data directly structure, everything should be same on the other server for the replication to work uh, correctly. And in this method, the wall replication will play an important role. Again, before we move into the streaming replication, um, before 9.0, there was also one more utility which used to come with the uh, Postgres called PG Standby. And that time it was just only warm standby kind of a thing. You had a, you have a one standby, but the standby is getting replicated based on the wall files it's receiving uh, from the primary using the PG standby tool, but you cannot do anything much with the standby. It's just really warm standby, which is in recovery mode. Then again, the streaming application which we are talking about, which got introduced in 9.0, um, we added one more capability called hot standby where your standby is in recovery mode, but you can still use it for other purpose, like read purpose. You can check everything is working correctly or not. So there are extra capabilities got added. Now with the hot standbys, there were some more features got added in the Postgres, mainly for durability purpose, because they, we wanted to make sure that user don't want to lose any transaction. And you can choose whether you want to go with the asynchronous application or synchronous application. That capability got added in the Postgres. So you can see over the period, we started adding more and more capability. So with our standby, we got synchronous, asynchronous application capability in the Postgres. And later on, we added more concept, more logic, or more intelligence into the Postgres based on the replication slots. So replication slots built a kind of a intelligence in the master or the primary server, so the primary server can retain the wall file which are needed by the standbys, and things can go smoothly. And later on, we added more capabilities like logical replication, which was mainly around replicating the transaction. And again, these transactions get extracted from the wall file using the logical decoding mechanism, which was added later on in the Postgres. And then DDL replication, all those pieces got added. So you can see over the period, the evolution of the replication in the Postgres, which brought the high availability capability inside the Postgres. Next slide, please. Yeah. So with adding the uh, capability, so let's get get into the details about the streaming application first, because this is the most popular, uh, I would say, ability capability, which most of the most of us are DBS who are using Postgres. They use it for the high availability. The streaming application in the streaming application, there will be primary and standbys. Um, you can have a standby in, um, across different geography, or you can have standbys into a same geography. On a different availability zone for the high availability. Now, uh, again, to configure uh, streaming replication, you need to first update the pghp.conf file, which is host based access method, where you can include the uh, allow the connections from the standbys. And, uh, and standbys would be able to use um, primary IP address to connect, where there will be a one wall receiver processes, again, when it's running in recovery mode and there will be a wall sender on the primary server side. And these wall receiver, what it's doing, it's just streaming the wall file directly from the primary server. And when it streams the wall file with streaming, standbys also apply these wall file directly on the standby. And this way you can maintain the high availability. If again, there are two different modes, you can use synchronous, asynchronous mode. In synchronous mode, primary guarantees that before it can confirm any transaction to the application, it wants to ensure that wall file has been received by the standby. And if you have, uh, you have set the parameter correctly, it will also ensure 
before committing or before sending a commit information to the application to ensure that your transition has been applied on the standby. So there is a com uh, confirmation around the durability which got uh, introduced with the synchronous standby. Again, there are some uh, ups and uh, there are some overhead, but you have to choose whether you want durability over performance or you want performance plus high availability both. So this is a uh, uh, very important capability which got added and later on we PostgreSQL evolved more and all the parameters of this uh, streaming application is now pretty much can be reloaded without restarting the standby. So it's amazing, right? Uh, next slide, please. Now, Postgres has the ability for create use, you can create a high availability using the streaming application. Um, again, capability which you have in the Postgres, but they are still a one gap where people always think about it, right? The gap is around how we can automate the failover and switch over thing because here, all the um, native capability you'll find in the Postgres all around streaming the wall file or creating the high availability using the hot standby concept and got introduced in the Postgres. But the tool which can manage it as a one cluster, which can ensure that in case something happened to the primary, how it can promote one of the standby to be a new primary and how it can reconfigure the other standby to become a standby of the new primary. So all those logic were still out, is not there, natively not supported in the Postgres yet. Now you cannot automate that. You can automate it if you understand the building blocks which are available in the Postgres. So that's why EDB came up with a one tool called EDB Failover Manager, which automates this uh, failover and switch work uh, in the Postgres cluster. In this case, you can have a one primary or multiple standbys, or you can have a one primary, one standby, one witness node. Witness node is also important thing because it helps you to detect uh, the whether it's a network failure or whether it's really primary down. Uh, so you can use a witness node to uh, identify that kind of a failure and EFM uses that. Now with this, uh, EFM can also track exactly which standby is close to the primary. So in case something happened to the primary, automatically EDB failover manager will choose the one which is nearest to the primary to be a new primary. So that kind of a logic we have created into the EDB failover manager. So overall, EDB failover manager helps you to automate the whole process around failure detections and promotion of one of the standby to be a primary, which is a big leap towards automating the stuff or making a system which is intelligent enough to identify these failures and recover itself in case of the failures. So using EFMs, you can achieve um, certain level of nines with a high availability. Let's talk about that. So here's one architecture where you can see, as I mentioned that with EDB failover manager, you can achieve any nines. Um, but with streaming application, mostly people actually can achieve the target availability of uh, four nines. But before we get into the target availability concept, let's understand this architecture. This is one example which we're presenting you. We name this architecture as departmental mission critical uh, because all the application which requires certain of a system resiliency or uh, automation around the availability of Postgres, this architecture can really help you to achieve that. In this architecture, you have a one primary and two standbys. Um, and again, in this architecture, you will see there is also a barman, which is for your uh, recovery. You, it is taking the back of the primary and you have a monitoring system using the Postgres enterprise manager. And the client can connect to the Postgres using the multi-host connection string. This is another capability which we have in the Postgres, where if one node is down, automatically using multi-host connection string, application can transparently connect to the next available node, right? Or if you don't uh, want to use multi-host connection string, you can use virtual IP address because the EDB failover manager allows you to use virtual IP address and can also transfer virtual IP address from the old primary to the new primary in case of the failure of the primary, right? There are some important concepts you can see. Uh, these are properties, I would say, of the architecture. One is called recovery time objective. That is how fast you want to recover your system, right? And 
Now with ADB Fedora Manager, with less than 30 seconds, you will be ha having a one, you'll be able to recover the whole system. That is, you will have one new primary available in case old primary was down. Um, recovery point objective, it's depending on the barman, which is backup and recovery capability you have. Uh, you will have, you can also have the geography redundancy. Uh, that is your standbys are across geography. So in case one region is down, you still have another region available will be able to serve your connection request and application will be able to connect smoothly to the new primary. And again, the target availability is four nines. Just want to highlight one more thing here. When we talk about target availability, it also means that your system, your, uh, your hardware, your infrastructure should be able to provide that kind of availability. So here target availability, we are talking only from the Postgres perspective. We believe that network which you have or the infrastructure which you have would be able to give you some level of high availabilities. And, and we'll get into more details about those measurements at the end. And what Vibor is describing here as recovery time objective really means from the moment, let's say EPAS one, the primary uh, stops functioning to the moment another server has been promoted and is re-establishing the connections, right? So we're looking at here less than 30 seconds of, of time where the service is not available. And remember what I said before about the four nines, right? Four nines give you, if I remember correctly, I think 40 to uh, 36 seconds, um, right? Per month yeah. of unplanned downtime, right? So, so with this, yeah, you could fail over once per month, right, and still meet your availability. But you can see it's it's cutting it it's cutting it already very very close. Okay, and as I said later on, we'll be much more specific about what this less than thirty seconds really means. Okay? Back to you, Vibor. Thank you, Mark. I think uh, that's a very good point you mentioned. That we should understand that part. Now there are some limitation with the streaming application, right, uh, and community and everybody's working on that. We'll talk about that later. So in the streaming application, right, you the read and write activity can go on a single server, which is a primary because standbys are always in a read only mode and in recovery mode, right? So you cannot perform any write activity. So the streaming application actually just, uh, doesn't give you write scalability. You will be able to use standbys for read uh, scalability, but um, the right of uh, scalability is not possible with a streaming application. Failover uh, is a little complex uh, and a lengthy process because in this case, detecting the failure of the primary takes a while. And after detecting the failure, it has to also ensure that the standby, which is close to the primary, old primary, has to be picked up first because you don't want to lose the transition. You want to minimize the transition loss in case of the failover, right? And then again, depending on how many, how much, how far is the standby behind the prim old primary and how much wall fight has to apply, the the promotion time takes, uh, promotion takes some time, right? Uh, so that's why it becomes a little lengthy process. Um, there are other uh, limitations, which is with the streaming application. Uh, other limitations are that Standby and the primary should be on the same version, same major version. There are two different versions which we talk about: major version, the minor version. Minor versions in the Postgres are pretty much patches or bug fixes which community releases, and the major versions are the one which comes with the new capabilities, new feature sets, um, and again, there is no backward compatibility with the major versions. So that's why primary and standby within the streaming application should be on the same version. Um, other thing is this, um, uh, when we talk about the primary and standby in the streaming application, it's a block level application, which means the structure, uh, the disk level structure of the primary and standby should be identical. It cannot be different, right? Um, and the maintenance operation, still you have to you have to perform on the main primary. So if you want to do a re-index or if you want to do a vacuum full command on the primary, you will be bearing some kind of a downtime because of these are maintenance operation you can only perform on the primary server so these are the some important limitations of the uh, streaming application but overall streaming application really gives you a robust and uh, a strong high availability which you can use with your primary server or with your postgres database
So next is logical application. This is another evolution of the Postgres, right? So in logical application, um, you actually create a one publication server. Primary will be a publication server, and your standbys will be a subscribers. They will be receiving the data again in the form of wall, uh, but decoded form of the wall, I would say. Uh, in this case, um, standbys connects to the primary and they decode the wall file and extract the transaction which it has to apply. And these are logical transactions which they apply, which uh, standbys are applying on, on the logical standby side. Now uh, here you can see certain parameters you would like to set like replication slots because the uh, slot is the way to which uh, master or the primary knows that what are the wall files it has to keep for the decoding purpose of the logical standby. And, and you can see there are some commands like create publication, create subscription, right? You can use these commands to ensure that you're streaming these logical transaction to the standbys. Again, there are two different modes available in the Postgres. One is called asynchronous logical standby and synchronous logical standby. These capabilities are already there. Um, and best part is that um, you can actually select what data sets you want to replicate from the primary to the standbys, right? You can, you can similar fashion, you can select certain tables or some certain data sets which you want to replicate from standbys to the primary. You can do the vice versa too again, but they will be a two different publication and subscription which you have to create. Um, a very interesting capability got added with the logical application. The key thing is this in this uh, logical application, logical application, you it's not a block level application, right? So the directory layout on the primary and standby can be different, right? Uh, because it's a logical transition applica uh, application which is happening on the standby side. And uh, and the major the version major versions can be different on to log on primary and standbys. So it's not really hard and fast rules that you need to have the same version on the primary and standby. So so when you're saying that the the structures can be a little different, that means I could have a logical replica that is optimized for querying, for example, right? That's whereas my master might be optimized for transactions. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that is correct because you can have a different parameter settings um, on the primary and standbys. Uh, also, um, you can think about the maintenance operations pretty much independent on the uh, from each other. Like in streaming application, you have to perform the maintenance operation directly on the primary. Then only the standby will be able to receive. But in case of logical application, you can perform the maintenance operation like vacuum for re-index on the standbys before you roll it out on the primary. So um, now there are some limitation with this native uh, logical application. One is that um, there is no DDL application. Like in streaming application, whatever changes you make, whether it's a DDL change, DML change, everything will be replicated from primary to the standby. But in case of logical application, uh, we don't have that capability yet. Uh, there is no automatic failover, right? How would you ensure that the data is getting streamed to the logical standby in case after the switch or how would you ensure that it goes reverse? Because the primary will be a standby and the new, uh, the one of the standby will be your new primary, right? That kind of automation failover capability is not there yet. There is no proper integration of the backup and recovery. Like for example, with a streaming application, if you have taken the backup of your primary, right, you will be able to recover your standby, or you can add another node using that um, backup, right? In case of logical standby, it's a little trickier. You have to ensure that you're taking the backup and you have to synchronize uh, when you are recreating the subscription um, of the primary. Other part is that. Uh, maintenance updates and upgrades are a little complicated because there is no automation around it. And again, it's a unidirectional. So there is no failback. You can make one of these standby to be a new primary, but if you want to make old primary as a standby, logical standby, you have to rebuild it using the, uh, um, rebuild it by, by creating a subscription on the old primary. So these are the key limitation of the native logical application which we have in the Postgres. Now let's, uh, so what are the next step of what, what we have done actually on top of these 
basic capabilities. So EDB actually, uh, we have uh, one new technology called BDR, bi-directional replication. So all the limitations which you had seen so far with the two replications, right? And all the capabilities which you have seen with the logical standby or logical replication, which is in, uh, in the Postgres, we use that capability and ensure that limitation which you're facing, we created a new technology called BDR, bi-directional application which is more like a mesh network where each node is working as a primary and they are uh, replicating the data across each other. So it's like a mesh network. It's an active active mesh network. Failover and switchover in this mesh network is simple. It's just rerouting the connection from one node to the other node, right? And if you want to switch back, you can again reroute the connection from one node to another node. There's advanced capability which has got added into the BDR to ensure that uh, there should be automatic conflict detection and automatic conflict management. Because if you're writing to two different nodes, it's possible if you haven't coded your application properly, there will be conflicts in the transaction. And those can be resolved quickly and easily using the BDR um, capability, which is built inside the um, BDR. You can choose what kind of a data set you want to replicate. You can replicate a subset of a data set or you can replicate the whole database from one node to the other node. Uh, you can downstream to another database. That is, you can have active active two nodes and there's another one standby which you can create, which can streaming the data direct, which may be streaming data from the other node. You can easily scale. You can add more and more node in the cluster. You can, uh, you can do a upgrade quickly and easily because here you can see if you choose a one node which you want to uh, upgrade to the another node, you can simply reroute a connection to the another active node and upgrade this node without any downtime. Amazing. You can do the same thing for the schema rollout um, or cross schema application. You can do easily all those um, uh, all those important activity with the Postgres PDR. Uh, Mark, you're on mute. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now about how this capability is being used. And I think what Vibor talked about, you know, um, uh, mesh-based, multi-master, logical replication will become a little bit will become a little bit more tangible when we look at, you know, how does this actually work. So, so let's look at at one of the BDR architectures and. There's a lot of stuff on this architecture. I'll try to walk you through it. It probably will, and hopefully will come, uh, will come together and make sense. So here you can see that we have four that we have four masters, right? The databases with the red stripe. Okay, they're in two data centers. So we have a lead master one, lead master two. Lead master means those are designated right now to to receive to receive transactions from the applications, right? Um, these transactions from the applications are being facilitated by a PG bouncer and HA proxy. Okay, so PG bouncer as a connection pooler and HA proxy as a uh, as a routing as a routing mechanism. Okay, so right now, lead master one is active, lead master three is active. So you can see that the mesh-based replication network makes sure that the shadow masters BDR two and BDR four are always in sync. Right, and they're always, as as Vibor said before, they're always active. Right, so theoretically, the app, the um, um, HA proxy could just automatically redirect any connection to BDR2, and we'd be just be in business. Now, the reason I'm I'm emphasizing that, and Vibor emphasized the same thing before, that they're both active, is there is actually no failover. Because when we looked at streaming replication, what takes time is identifying a failure, verifying the failure, and then promoting the replica. We said it's a lengthy process, lengthy meaning 15, 20, sometimes 30 seconds, right? Lengthy in computer terms. Um, and in logical replication, you don't have that because all the members of the cluster are active at any given point in time. You can just use them and all it, and the only time, the only reason it takes time is because the software that we've wrapped around PG Bouncer and NHA Proxy, which we call our high availability router, HARP, um, needs to identify that, oh, Lead Master One is not responding. Oh, it's not responding. Let me check one more time. Oh, it's not responding. 
And because there's no failover, it can just quickly redirect the connection to Shadow Master, to a Shadow Master, in this case, BDR2, and we're back in business. And there's literally no time spent between those two actions, except, you know, checking um, uh, Lead Master 1, are you still healthy? Are you accepting connections? Okay, so this allows us then also to very gracefully handle situations of switchover, failover, underlying hardware failure, et cetera, and actually do that very, very quickly. Okay, so this is how you can see, um, this is how you can see how, how these architectures are coming together. And just like Oracle's uh, maximum availability architectures, um, the BDR always on architectures come in different flavors. What I showed you before is what we call the platinum architecture, which is the most complex one and most capable one. And then there are uh, other architectures that are either for single sites or a single site with, a, with an offsite DR location or two sites, which you know, in this case here, when you look at always on gold, that's a replacement for a combination of uh, rack and golden gate, right? Two rack clusters connected with a, with a golden gate replication connection and this is how you would replace them. So you can see here how these architectures allow you to achieve five nines of availability because they can very, very quickly identify failures and deal with them because actually there's no failover. You just kind of redirect the connection to another active member of the cluster. There's different variants of these clusters and when you would use them and how you would use them. And again, we're making these slides available to you after the, the webinar, so you don't need to you don't need to, 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 to study every single thing in here. But obviously these architectures fulfill somewhat different purposes or different use cases uh, with offsite locations, uh, offsite locations that are immediately also highly available, offsite locations that don't have built-in high availability, et cetera. And then, you know, they have different impact on the, on the, on the network traffic that, uh, that you're going to see at the same time. So, so basically, there's lots of different options for how you would go about this. So remember, at the beginning of the presentation, um, the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the streaming replication. Now we talked about logical replication. We said streaming replication gets you up to four nines. If you need to go higher, you take five nines. Okay, that's basically where the boundary is. Well, it's not exactly that simple, okay? And we'll show you how you can actually operationalize these decisions, okay? So first, before we go into the details, here are some data on when Vibor said before, it takes, it's a lengthy process, it takes all of 30 seconds, right? Which is already pretty good. Um, but here's the data that we really see um, in, in, uh, in longer and um, in longer tests that were run in high numbers. So where we see the difference between a switchover and a crash, just quickly explain what a switchover is. A switchover is when I, I, I go from a primary to my replica, but it is me as the DBA deciding that it happens and when it happens, right? So it's intentional. Whereas the crash is really a failover. And there's two different situations here. There's the, the software crash where the Postgres database itself crashes or the underlying system, let's say the operating system or the hardware fails. And the question is, how long does it really take to, uh, to reestablish the service? And as I said before, this is from occurrence of the failure till the service has been reestablished okay so it's uh, this is really from you know going down to being happy again um, and you can see that the switch over here uh, on average takes us less than 300 milliseconds okay so that's really really quickly when the dba controls it if there's an error right so when now error detection comes in we're looking at about 1.7 uh, seconds on average to do this. Okay, um, it can go up to like uh, uh, two, two and a quarter seconds uh, at at the maximum. So you can see this is really, really fast. This is with logical replication. Okay, uh, the equivalent EFM setup with streaming replication before is somewhat longer. Where Fibor said it's less than thirty seconds. It's a lengthy process because we have to identify a failure. And then we have to verify a failure just because 
promotion is an expensive process, right? So we really want to make sure that we don't fail over and promote um, um, for for no good reason. You can see there that that our average times for a switchover or a Postgres crash or even a system crash are in the 12 to 14 second range. Okay, so it's still it's still pretty good. It still allows you to uh, to trust the system for um, um, for meeting your four nines availability. But you can also see that if you want to go above that, um, that logical replication is the way to go because otherwise you're 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 betting on things not going bad and you know the cio's famous last words were you know this should work right so um don't do that so postgres has plenty of good tools and this is how you can take a decision this is this is how we would present the framework for you to take a decision if your if your high availability requirements are are less than 99.9% you have enough time. You don't actually need uh, a framework like EFM or BDR. You can use them. They make life easier. They will make sure that things happen automatically behind the scenes, on the week, on the weekends, on, at night, etc. So they're still very, very useful. But you have enough time to actually do things manually too. Now, when you go above 99.9%, we would absolutely say you should use a framework like EFM or Rep Manager for that, for that matter, um, uh, to assure that you can do that. But it's not just, not just the failover time that, uh, that should be considered. There's also certain operations in Postgres that may be needed every once in a while. And these operations on Postgres require exclusive locks on the database. So, which basically means there can't be there can't be any traffic, any other traffic on the database. Now, many many databases can avoid these operations completely, but it's not always possible. Okay, and these operations, the most known ones, are um, re-indexing or vacuum full. Okay, so if you have to plan for those, then again, BDR is something that you should be considering because um, they require an exclusive lock, and as Vibor said before. In, in, in streaming replication, you have to do these things on the primary, which basically means while they run, everything stops, okay? In logical replication, you can do them on any member of the cluster one at a time. You just route the traffic somewhere else, which basically means they can be done concurrently while another member of the cluster handles all the traffic. That's the big difference. So understanding that will guide you whether for that green box, you should use BDR or EFM. Understanding that is important. And if you go above four nines of availability, uh, uh, above four nines of availability towards five nines, then you know BDR is really your only option. Um, and uh, one thing that I should say here: everything that Vibor and I talked about uh, exists on prem or in the cloud. Okay, so this is not limited to to uh, to a deployment option. Okay. But this is really like the, the decision matrix that we would suggest employing to figure out, okay, where do I go? Do I need a failover tool? Do I need a failover tool with streaming replication? Or do I really need to go to logical replication and use something like Postgres BDR? So now we have time for, uh, we have time for questions. Um, and... Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions that I can see here in the in the in the question panel. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, so one of the questions was that probably came in a little earlier: Are these high availability technologies available in the cloud and on-prem? And yes, they are. Um, they are available, you know, on on VMware, uh, on on infrastructure as a service. So it's the same. The same technology that's available there. Uh, BDR right now is not yet available as a Kubernetes operator, but early next year we will introduce a BDR operator for Kubernetes. So um, then you can do the same thing and achieve the same kind of high availability in your in your Kubernetes deployment. Yeah, and there is a question asked around: um, Are EFM and BDR integrated with the Postgres Enterprise Manager. So answer is yes, it's well integrated. 
but EFM is a different technology and BDI is a different technology. Uh, and Postgres Enterprise Manager can monitor both and can alert you in case something goes wrong. So you can monitor and manage everything using Postgres Enterprise Manager for EFM and the BDR. And Vibor, here's another question. Somebody wants to use BDR with Postgres 9.6 or with RDS Postgres. Does that work? Yeah, uh, it will not work. <laughs> the reason is that um, there are some capabilities which uh, require at the, uh, at the server level. So if you go with the RDS Postgres, you don't have access to the binary or the server level. You're just accessing the service of the Postgres, right? Um, and with 9.6, there are something, uh, some ca capability which we need in the Postgres is missing. So that's why it's not available right now in the 9.6. Uh, I think they, we have a Postgres extended version that supports uh, BDR, which you could use it. And that should work if you're using the community version of the Postgres. Yeah. Yeah. So there are ways to help you there. But I think the key message here is that RDS Postgres does not support something like BDR uh, or EFM. And if you're thinking about high availability on RDS Postgres, I encourage you to read the SLA documentation from Amazon because uh, it'll make it very clear what kind of an SLA they stand behind, okay? Um, so if we wanna go higher, I think some of the materials that we discussed here uh, might come in, might come in very useful. So I think that's the last question that we had. Um, so thank you very much and I'll pass it back to Lucy. Right. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was a great presentation. And so DZone would like to thank Vibor and Mark. And we'd also like to thank EDB for providing the audience with a great webinar. Uh, lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We really hope that you learned something new to help you in your career. Thank you. <laughs>